I'm Jared. I'm Marcus. Level with us. Welcome to episode three of our show, where we'll be going over week three of Neo, The World Ends With You. So there are spoilers ahead for the end of the game. And uh, in order to get started with discussing it, Marcus, you have to tell us what's happening. All right, it's week three and Game Master Shiba is pulling out all the stops. He unleashes a new plague noise across Shibuya and challenges players to find him and fight him directly. Uh, Things look pretty dire until a new teammate shows up, the legendary player from the previous game, Neku. Very exciting. The Wicked Twisters fight to survive the increasingly brutal game, and there are casualties along the way. Team captain of the Variety Beauties, Kanon, is erased, and also the Twisters are forced to fight and erase Suzukichi and Shoka's Reaper friend, Ayano. There's a whole lot of time travel, too. The Twisters fight and defeat Shiba, but discover that Kubo has been pulling the strings the whole time. He calls himself the Executor, an angel sent from a higher plane sent to erase Shinjuku and Shibuya. His weapon of destruction is noise created from Rindo's pin from whenever he time travels. The Wicked Twisters lose against Kubo's noise, and each one of them gets erased besides Rindo. Rindo then finds himself in restored Shibuya, uh, and is asked for a tour by a mysterious man named Haz. As the tour goes on, Haz reveals himself as a higher being, and offers Rindo a final chance to defeat Kubo's noise and save his friends. He takes the offer, and this time it's all hands on deck. With the assistance of Rhyme, Shiki, and all the remaining Reapers, including Shiba, the Wicked Twisters defeat the Noise and save Shibuya from Erasure. Back in the RG, Rindo and his friends meet up, including Shoka, who was his gaming friend Swallow the whole time. The end. Well, thank you, Marcus. That was a very detailed uh, synopsis of what just happened in the final week. And uh, I have a lot of questions for you because I'm very curious about your opinions. Um, the listeners may not know, we do not talk about the game before we record the episode, or at least we try very hard not to. So, uh, Marcus, how was it? How, how was the game? Maybe let's start with an earlier beat in the story. Uh, so, Neku arriving. How were you? How'd you react to Neku showing up? Uh, I was excited. I I was pretty certain it was going to happen, like, for yeah. various reasons. So, I was just happy when he finally showed up. I was like, yes, <laughs> now... Now things can get kick into high gear. Now I get six buttons to mash. So I, I was pretty excited. Probably not as surprised as when Beat shows up, but excited enough that I was like, ah, oh, nice. I do actually agree with that. I think Beat's moment was a little more hype. Um, I think Neku, it, it still made me really happy to see him, but they kind of milked it a bit, which is fine. So six, six party members. That feels awesome. I, I loved having all the uh, all the buttons. I love that in the final boss battle, this would actually be really annoying for someone like me who is currently playing with a cast on one hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you have to hold all six buttons down at oh, once. Oh, shoot. I forgot about that part. <laughs> How'd you manage that? Uh, some creative. L- luckily, it doesn't expect you to do it quickly. So there, it was definitely deliberate, like, uh, A. B, or sorry, it's not even A and B, it's X, Y, L, R, Z, L, Z, R. It's great. It's great. It worked out. I I thought that was a fun way to kind of like cap off the game mechanic of the battle system. It's like, now you're holding all the buttons. So that was fun. Cool. What about the uh, the rest of the game? Uh, What, what, listen, it was a lot of text, right? It was a lot of story. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of time travel, Mm -hmm. like multiple time travel trips. Were you just kind of done when you had to go through so much of it, or were you engaged the whole way through? Well, I was trying to finish so you and I could record this in a timely manner, so there was a little bit of, all right, this is final day apostrophe apostrophe, like, uh, <laughs> so I, th- there was a little part of me that wanted to, you know, move on, but even though there was like just tons of dialogue around the part, I do like the direction the final part of the game went where it was like, everyone is here. Yeah, it just felt like everyone is here. It was like every character who was alive uh, and important kind of like came together and utilized their skills together. So I I thought that that was kind of a cool... It was like how Kingdom Hearts 3 should have been, you know? Like, it should have 
felt satisfying when all of these characters show up, you know? No, yeah, no, it, it was great. I, I loved seeing Rhyme, really loved seeing Shiki. Um, I had some thoughts on Joshua, but I'll save it later for my quick jab. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it was cool to kind of see them tie both games. And it kind of adds to that idea that you and I said in the first episode, I think, about this game is very much tied to the original. Like, yeah, you can technically play it like without playing the original and follow it. Okay, but it's really, really meant to be played after you've played the original. Because there's so many just little payoffs and little character moments that just, I don't know, I, I don't feel like they would land for someone who's playing this mm -hmm. for the first time, you know? Well, I will say that week three especially was very reliant on the final remix uh, version of the first game. Like, that story, I did not play that game. Uh, I, I knew one or two things from it, but especially since it's called Final Remix, there was no like indication to me that it was important to the story. So when there were like these little hints that felt like they referenced something else where Coco is like, oh, I resurrected Sho Minamimoto and stuff like that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> there was apparently several things that went down that I was completely unaware about. Which is fine. I just wish I kind of knew how much of a building block that final remix another day was going to be. Yeah, I, I kind of wish they did a little better job summing up those story points. Since I, I, I would have really liked it if they made this game um, a hundred percent accessible for people who played the first game. Like I don't mind that there's things that only people who played the first game get. Like it's a sequel that makes sense, but not everyone played the Switch port. There's an iOS port and the original DS port. Right. It's, it's a little tricky for them to, like, be so reliant on some details from it. And n not, you know, obviously they sort of explain some of these beats, but it's not immediately, I, I don't know, it just sort of doesn't land when you're like, wait, why does Beat hate Coco so much? And why does Coco, you know, ne Neku casually drops that he was shot by Coco and all of these things. Right. I'm like, yeah, this sounds like this is a part of its own story that I have missed, you know? Oh, well. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. On that note, uh, I while I did love all the payoffs and uh, characters from the first game showing up, um, I, I do wish we had a little more development with the new characters, mm. if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. the, the first game had a pretty clever plot device in that each player, each partner that you have in the game has to pay an entrance fee to play the game. And it's always the thing that matters most to them. So as they play, you get to learn about who they are and what they want, and they develop as characters, and they change. Shiki has an arc, Beat kind of has an arc, um, and, and Neku absolutely does for the entire game. You see him evolve over time. And there were little moments, for sure. Like, um, Fret had the whole thing with Kanon uh, about being more authentic, and he had a friend who passed away or committed suicide or something, and... So I, I didn't, I was happy they included that. You know, they kind of talk about Nagi is really good at being empathetic. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there were character arcs. Yeah, they just didn't land as well. Like, Rindo is, like, indecisive. I, I think it just wasn't quite as compelling as, like, having a character that was as brutally individualistic as Neku was. Yeah. So, I don't know. You could definitely make an argument that the original characters kind of overshadow everything at, in the finale, you know? Just because their moments, we, we get the most time with them, I felt like. And I really, and which is great, but I also really like these new characters, and I would have just liked a little more time with them. But, you know, it's not a, I'm, I'm not trying to complain about it. Like, I thought it, overall it was a good story, and um, I thought this game had a, pretty good ending i mean it could have been worse <laughs> i don't yeah i don't think the ending was disappointing i do think a couple of the beats were a little convoluted um but also this is the genre we're looking at right now jrpg you know jrpg yeah like i had mixed feelings about you know this giving has a tour thing because on the one hand i was like i don't you know this the pacing of this is very strange how it's like slowing down significantly and kind of like being kind of mysterious and all these things and i was like yeah i don't, I don't know how i feel about uh, just a brand new character being tossed in to take this role but also has was kind of cool i i just sort of conceptually like the idea of this guy showing up and being like hey friend how do you feel about feelings fascinating it's like <laughs> 
just so patronizing. I kind of like it. If I can come to Haz's defense, I actually really liked that part. I liked how it slowed things down a bit right before things kind of kick into gear. Um, now, what follows still takes a long time to reach the ending, but I liked how it felt different. I liked how different Rindo felt because he had just lost all of his friends. So I actually really enjoyed that part. I thought it was a nice break from the action. I was really curious. And when I first saw Haz, I actually thought he was Joshua. Did 100%. You have the same? Yeah. 100%. I, well, I thought he had to be Joshua. And then when he wasn't, I was like, what? Like, is Joshua not going to show up? Oh, he sure does. He sure does an hour later. Right. But, but at least you could tell, I mean, the fact that we thought that, I'm inferring that he's the composer of Shinjuku. Oh, I think he's a step up. I think he's like a level above the composers. I don't think so. Because if Joshua was the composer, I think he's Joshua's equivalent in Shinjuku because he cleansed it, uh, but Joshua chose not to. And also because his jurisdiction only went to Shinjuku, he had to kill Kubo. Neither of us had read the secret reports, so maybe those would shed some light on yeah. who has his. Because they introduce him and they he kind of leaves. like It's kind of a little mystery, like a little, like, oh, there could be another game in the franchise at some point, you know? I, that's what I felt, at least. So, how, how'd you do on the final battle, besides the having difficulty pressing all the buttons? <laughs> final battle was fine. Uh, Suzu Kichi, I did six times. Ooh. Yeah, so that was hard. Uh, the final boss was cool. Uh, it had some wonky camera angles in there. It was pretty, pretty trippy, a, a little difficult at times to spatially understand what was going on. A lot of bright flashing <laughs> lights, but um, it didn't like, it, it wasn't that big of a detriment. Yeah, I agree. I liked the design. I thought the, uh, the Rainbow Phoenix was very, very cool looking, but it went a little too long for me. But again, JRPGs, that's just kind of how final battles roll, so. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, any any other thoughts overall about the uh, ending of this game, or the game in general? Generally, I really liked the character design and character personalities. I, I, I thought that that was one of the biggest strengths of the game. Um, I love the, the... At first, I was kind of hesitant about the whole Rindo Shoka, like, chemistry going on. But then, like, over time, I really warmed up to it. I was like, oh, I kind of like this. You know, just little hints here and there that they might be into each other. Also, I actually think I laughed when Shoka finally says that she's Swallow because she's, like, dying, reaching out to him and fading away. I just wanted to play Fango one last time. I was like, ah, that's why she didn't say it earlier. So she could say it dramatically as she dies. Got it. I, I'm a anyway. sucker. I, I liked that scene. I didn't roll my eyes at all. I thought it was great. Uh, her being swallowed made a lot of sense, and it also means, oh, well, no wonder I've been liking her, even when she was, like, not helpful at all. Like, she was helping them the whole time, like, even before she joined the team. Right. Um, I guess one of the reasons that I, like, had that reaction of kind of laughing is, like, I, I was, like, pretty certain that she was swallow. I would just really, I was, when she joined the team, I was like, why isn't she said yet? Like, Rindo even mentions, like, he's trying to figure out Swallow, I think, at some time, and she says nothing, and I'm like, why, why isn't she? And I was like, oh, because it's more dramatic this way. Okay. You were trying to, so you figured it out before the reveal? Like, you, you were, like, pretty certain it was her? Yeah. I mean. Oh, okay. I didn't. It was a surprise for me, so maybe oh, gotcha. that's why the moment landed for me. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it was a bit like the, the Neku thing, where I was like, I know th this is going to happen eventually, you know? How about you? What g general thoughts about the game? Like, I don't know if we're doing reviews on this show, but like, got a rating for it? I'm not, I'm not going to score it, uh, but I had a good time, for sure. Um, I, I think week three didn't hold up as well as the first week, just because of how new it felt and how, you know, the, it's the benefit of introducing all the mechanics and... Uh, being exciting and new and like I said I felt like the original characters kind of overshadow things a bit in the end um, but it didn't I didn't it didn't sour my experience um, it, it was great and uh, I enjoyed playing this game it was nice to have a nice big beefy game to play through this year because I actually haven't really I've only played like some short games this year Mm. And uh, maybe towards the end of the year, you and I can do a, an episode about the favorite games we played this year. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, no, I, th I think Neo Twiwi will make that list for me. I had a good time. Awesome. Well, let's move on to Star Pieces. 
This is the part of the show where we talk about cool little details or things we liked about the game. Uh, and we also read what our listeners liked as well. So I'll start us off. Um, you mentioned earlier that this game could have been like Kingdom Hearts. And I, I think we take it for granted in JRPGs certain things. Um, and one thing I took for granted was that the plot was actually pretty clear in this game. Like, I felt like there wasn't... There's some plot holes for sure, but like... There was not a lot of vagueness that could have been in there, if that makes sense. Um, so I like that they, even though there were some exposition dumps, I like that they acknowledged the first game uh, and its plot and not just kind of hint at it. Um, for example, and I wrote a couple little details down that I liked, uh, Neku's not wearing headphones. I feel like if he was wearing headphones when he showed up, that would kind of defeat the purpose of the first game. So to me, like, seeing that, I'm like, okay, the developers understand how important it is that Neku is not wearing headphones, right? Uh, I like that he's wearing Shiki's brand. They, like, barely mention it, but I like that he's wearing a jacket uh, from her brand. Um, I like that they mention Hanekoma, even though he doesn't show up. I like that they mention him when he's on Cat Street. Like, of course Neku would bring up Hanekoma when they go to Cat Street. Like, I really appreciated that. I liked that they didn't play Twister or Calling until Neku showed up. I thought that was really smart. That, that was actually going to be my star piece. <laughs> oh, shoot. I, I, it, it's totally fine. I'll just, we'll have one star piece and I'll, I'll jump in now and say, I also liked that. <laughs> Sp specifically, it, it was around the third week where I was thinking, like, I haven't heard Twister yet. That was kind of like the, the most solidly twoey song of the first game. I wonder why they haven't used it. And then Neku comes up and they play that music and I was like that's why it's because it's like a blast of nostalgia hearing that song associated with that character yeah cool well thanks for sharing this star piece with me Marcus there's enough star pieces to to go around um this I'm not sure if this is a star piece but I do want to read a uh, comment by one of our listeners um this is by Sluffy G with a uh, three F's in Sluffy so they're really Sluffy what, wait, why didn't you pronounce it correctly then? Oh, sorry. Sluffy G. Thank you. Another great podcast, guys. A small bit of foreshadowing about Motoy is that his quotes start good and get worse and worse to show that he's running out of ideas since he's cut off from the people to steal from. Hmm. That Okay, th well, first of all, thank you very much for commenting that. That is yeah. a really cool detail I did not notice. I definitely didn't think of that either. So we were kind of just bashing Motoy with no... <laughs> Can I mean, weren't, weren't they all bad though? Like, <laughs> yes, but they were worse later on. They were. I there is. I, I'll give them I'm, not, I'm not trying to debunk what Sluffy G just said. I just, I, I didn't really see that in my playthrough. But maybe if I went through it again, I, I would notice. But, um, but yeah, that if that's true, that's, <laughs> that's a really cool detail. We'll have to like get a a graph going and like chart badness of the quotes and see if the line trends up or down yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> i don't know anyway thank you very much for commenting that and for any of our other listeners who would like their comment to be read in our show you can email us at level with us podcast at gmail.com or comment on the youtube version of our show and so it's time we had our star piece we got to get into some uh quick jabs jab 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 one two and jab yeah. This is a part of the show where we get to uh, talk about something that bugged us a bit, but not for very long. That's why it's a quick jab. Shall I start? Please do. Man, we have really beaten a dead horse with this time travel thing. And I, I hate I hate to bring it Hasn't up again. Hasn't this been your quick jab every episode so far? Yes. Yes. We're, the next game we play, I'm going to say my quick jab is time travel, even if there isn't time travel in the game. Yeah, right, right. No, it's it's not the time travel. It's there's a day. Maybe I just didn't understand it. The day that you fight, I, you know, you have to talk to Shoka in like six different conversations or whatever. And each one of them, you like ask her, like, were you close? Did you like her? Was she bullying you? Oh, yeah, that was pretty bad. Which, that would be, like, fun and fine. I thought it was kind of interesting to have, like, these different questions. It was, I didn't know what the correct answers were. There were, like, times that I answered things all felt good. Like, you know, they. It, it's like real life, you know? Like, you don't know exactly what your words are going to mean or do for a person. So the fact that there was one of them where I literally had to brute force it. Like, there were... 
four different questions. Each of them had four options. And I worked through like almost every iteration because I didn't know, do I have to get all four of them right? Is it like three of the four is enough? So it was just a very confusing mechanic for me. And it took a very long time. Conceptually, it's a cool idea. Go throughout the day and like prime a person by talking to them to be prepared for what's about to happen. Like I, I like that idea, but absolutely same here. Some of those, I literally had to choose each combination in order to figure it out because I, I think the first two, I figured it out pretty quick. It seemed obvious what the correct answers were, but no, no, the other ones didn't seem like there were like bad or good things you could say. And mm -hmm. some I picked just because I wanted to hear the conversation, but yeah, that, that, that was pretty dumb. Some of them I just picked because I was like, I don't feel like there's a wrong answer. It's like when you get a test from a teacher and it's like, what should you obey? A, your internal compass, B, your moral standards, C, the law, or D, it's like, is there an all of the above? I feel like it should be all of the above, you know? like I, Yeah, that, no, that, that was a good quick job. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot how much I disliked that part. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I have so many quick jabs, actually. I wrote at least three or four down. But we're only going to do one, because this is quick jabs. This is not long jabs. This is not uppercuts. This is just quick jabs, just a little... Some Someday we'll have uppercuts. My quick jab is actually something I kind of liked. But it's a <laughs> quick jab, because I think it was unnecessary. And that was Joshua showing up at the end. Because, <laughs> listen, I was happy... I really was. I took a screenshot when he showed. I took a screenshot every time it showed one of the new, one of the original characters showing up. I love Joshua, but like there was no reason for him to come at the end. Like literally, what what did he say when he showed up? He's like, "Oh hey, mind if I watch?" Like he Partner. he just showed up. Yeah, he just showed up for no reason. Neku's like, "Thanks, Joshua." I'm like, dude. Like, let's have, let's actually take a moment. Like, I, I want to see them interact with him, but not like right. this. Like, if you're going to show up, don't just have it be lip service. Like, yeah. have it matter. I don't know. It just kind of felt tacked on to me. It felt, to me, it felt more like, well, we showed all the other characters. We have to have Joshua come in. And like, yeah, he he's the reason Shoka, you know, is able to come back at the end, which is cool. But that's my quick jab. Well, like a bolt from the blue, it's time for our final Reaper review. I've got a great question for you, Marcus. Are you ready? Uh-huh. Maybe. So, now that you've played to the end, and we can talk freely about the game, obviously a lot of characters from the original showed up, and what was really cool about that was the majority of them had their original voice actor from the first game. But there was one character who did not have their original voice actor from the first game. Marcus is making all sorts of facial expressions right now. Who was that character, Marcus? Who was the only character from the first game whose voice actor or actress did not return to voice them in Neo? You're not going to give me options? Nope, you just got to guess because there's there's a there's a very limited amount. Right. You know, I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to guess quick because I don't think I'm going to logic my way into this. Rhyme, final answer. You got it. Hey, <laughs> my own the reason I guess that is because she is a small girl. And often small girls, their voices change or, you know, like when someone grows up, maybe they would want to have a different voice. I, I mean, it was it was very well, you got it correct. So it was a great guess. So um, my logic may or may not be <laughs> right. But no, you got it correct. Um, I'm pretty sure she was voiced by an adult in both games. But Rhyme's original voice actor in The World Ends With You was Kate Higgins. She, but then in Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance, where all of the Twiwi characters make a cameo, she was replaced by Ashley Rose. And so Ashley Rose also voiced Rhyme in this game. So she's voiced Rhyme before, but not in the original. But I actually have a second part to this question for extra credit. Stop it. Stop it. Extra credit. Kate Higgins is still in the game. Uh, so the original voice actress for Rhyme is still in the game but she voices a different character. I'm gonna give you the options. Which character does she voice? Uzuki, Kanon, Uzuki, final answer. Nagi, or Ayano? Good, uh, the first one. Uzuki, final answer. You got it right? Yeah. Yeah, She so she voiced Uzuki and Rhyme in the original. 
And fun fact, she is also the voice of Pauline in the Mario series, including Jump Up Superstar. She actually is the one who sang it, which is really cool. Uh, she cool. she also voices Tails and some of the Sonic games and stuff like that. So cool. Well, good job. Even though you completely blindly guessed both parts of that question, that's uh, not the name of the game. Who who cares how you get the answer? Life is all about whether or not you succeed or fail. All right, it's your turn. I don't really have a good one, so. Uh, oh well what is the symbol on the back of motoy's laptop oh my gosh i don't know i feel like it would have just been the symbol for the pure hearts right which is a heart i think it's a heart correct (laughs) that's literally it yep oh thank gosh (laughs) and it's 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 funny when i decided to ask that i forgot that his team was the pure hearts so I just well, the, well, the Varia it, beauties, I think, might have a heart in their symbol, too, actually. Ah, uh, no, there's this, like, lips. There's this, like, a kiss oh, mark. Oh, you're right. Yeah, the but, Varia beauties is a kiss mark. Hey, um, that's all I got for you today. No extra credit. So, oh, I guess I answered two questions. You answered one. No, 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 no. This is a tie game. It. Stop shaking your head. We're moving on. Uh, it's time for rabbit holes. <laughs> This is the part of the show where we talk about whatever we want to talk about. And uh, usually I talk about something non-video game related, but this time I am going to talk about a video game called Psychonauts 2. I uh, don't have an Xbox, but I really wanted to play this game. I have the original. I got the original for free on Steam, and my old laptop was still able to to chug and uh, play it if I shrank the window size to be really small. And I'm a big fan of Double Fine and and Tim Schafer's games, so um, I was really excited when the game came out, I just didn't have a way of playing it, so I borrowed my friend's Xbox, which was very nice of him, and I did a a month subscription to Game Pass just so I could play through it, and I did. Took about 8 to 10 hours, uh, and it was pretty good. Um, The thing that stood out to me the most was that this is a 3D platformer with a very in-depth story like it's not the most complicated story ever but there's a lot of dialogue and there's a lot of threads there's like several plot threads and like several mysteries that they resolve by the end of the game and i just can't think of any 3d platformers that do it ratchet and clank kind of have a a story but i feel like it's pretty straightforward um same for crash bandicoot this one it's like these characters are living different lives and interacting with each other and it's a 3D platform. I don't know. I, I think it's because of Tim Schafer. He comes from a, a background in adventure games. So every game he makes, even if it's a different genre, it's going to have a lot of story and a lot of thought put into it, uh, which is really cool. And like the tw- the twists in the game weren't like earth shattering or anything, but I really appreciated that they were there. I really appreciated that this was a story I was invested in. And it's just kind of icing on the cake that the gameplay is super fun too. Uh, so yeah, I really liked it. Cool. Yeah, I, I'll have to give it a try. Yeah, I'd recommend it to anyone who's uh, interested. So, what's your rabbit hole? So, I have a roommate who has a VR setup, which is just awesome. I've bought VR games before and played them on his system. Um, I played a few new games, and so I just thought I'd mention them. There's one called I Expect You to Die, and it's these really kind of small scenarios that are like escape rooms almost. Uh, you're a spy, and you're trying to accomplish some objective. And it's mostly kind of a puzzle in what order do you do things in. Like, there was one time when I bashed open a car window and there was poison gas on the outside, and I really wasn't thinking of why I was even bashing open the car window. I guess I just wanted to see if I could do it. Uh, But then I died because, you know, poison gas and all that. So it was pretty fun. I kind of appreciated the variety in them. They felt a little bit like tech demos almost, you know, like because you got these kind of small-ish scenarios. Um, But what's interesting is I kind of think I prefer those bite-sized VR chunks um, because I I, I tried out Half-Life Alex, uh, probably the first three hours of it or so. And yeah, I don't think I'm ready for those yet, though, just because it is it is a lot to have this giant rig strapped to your face for like hours. I kind of think for me, the VR is more enjoyable as a party game thing like a thing where you know you do beat saber and you show people how good or bad you are and then you hand it off to someone else like i don't think at least for a while yet i'm going to be like alone playing vr for hours 
maybe if I was a child, I could, but you and I have talked about this before. Our like video game stamina is not what it used to be. Like we can't play for like 12 hours like we might've done when we were young, you know? So. Sure. I've looked up stuff about Half-Life Alex. It looks pretty cool. What's your favorite part of that game? Or what did you enjoy the most in the short time you played it? Yeah, in the short time I played it, uh, the gravity gauntlets, gravity gloves, whatever they're called. It feels very intuitive and very cool to like reach out to an object that's really far away from you flick it towards you and catch it when it reaches you so that makes you feel it's, it's one of the scenes that you know you feel like a boss which is i think all the best vr games are like kind of power fantasies you know like beat saber you have two lightsabers and you're just destroying these things and you feel awesome pistol whip or super hot it's just cool to feel cool cool well i haven't really played much vr but i would love to try out some of those games for sure well this was a lot of fun Thank you for joining me, Marcus. Thank you for having me, Jared. And to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us. This is the last episode where we talk about Neo, The World Ends With You. Uh, But next week, we will be talking about a little indie game called Overboard. So if any of you have that game or are interested in talking about it, uh, please feel free to let us know what your comments are. And until then, I'm Jared. I'm Marcus. And we'll level with you next week. Thanks for leveling with us. The funky music cover of Calling You Heard was provided with permission by Legend AV. You can find the full version over on his YouTube channel. You also heard Zigzag by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. All other original music was composed by Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. But uh, yeah, I, I have so many quick jabs, actually. I wrote at least three or four down. I guess I'll, I'll mention some briefly. Like one of them is having to fight and then winning the fight. But then the characters being like, oh, no, we're about to die. I'm like, what? Oh, I, ju- I just too, They're won. too powerful. Run away. I'm like, Minamoto's fight. I'm like, dude, I just beat him. I'm like, what? Right. I, I literally did think that beat was going to die there. And I was like, come on, guys. It's cheap, but I'd rather I fought them and just couldn't do any damage to them. And then I could feel their power instead of just them telling me that we can't feel their power. But that's not my quick jab. So let me move on from that one. Uh, Also, the difficulty spike was really hard. Also, Kubo being behind the whole thing was spoiled in the trailer. (laughs) And I'm really mad about it. It absolutely was. It was. Really? I did not see that trailer. It's just a scene with the doomsday happening and you see Rendo on the ground and you see Kubo watching him. But that's not the quick jab either. So what was your rabbit hole? What's your rabbit hole? Once more time with conviction. What's your rabbit hole? Thanks. (laughs) This is the part of the show where we talk about cool little details or things we liked about the game uh, as well as our listeners. So Marcus, why don't you uh, start us off? Well, I like our listener named... Uh, <laughs> the way you phrase that sentence, it sounds like, or talk about our favorite listeners. So, hey, you, the one who's listening to my voice right now, you're my favorite. <laughs>